Hi everyone, this is Miriam Naime from the Alan Turing Institute and Newcastle University. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging webinar. The webinar is an activity of the Vehicle Grid Integration Group at the Alan Turing Institute. The Turing is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial intelligence. One of the objectives of the institute is to apply data science methods to help overcome some, some of the real world challenges, such as what we are doing in the vehicle integration group, where we are supporting the decarbonization of transport and electricity infrastructure. We've had several episodes on the webinar already covering communication protocols for electric vehicles, but also we hosted representatives uh, from government to talk about policies, to talk about uh, national rollout uh, of EV charging, and also some companies who talk to us about their uh, smart charging activities. You can find the slides on our landing page, and also you can find uh, the videos on our YouTube playlist. This graph is showing the different stakeholders and entities involving, involved in a vehicle grid integration. And um, these entities are sharing a lot of information. So we have information flowing up the system, control commands going down. And two, two points we make here is that we, we'd like to see those entities speaking very few languages. So right now, You'll have uh, charging manufacturers, for example, adopting their own communication protocol, but we want to move to a future where these entities are speaking very few languages so that we avoid having a fragmented infrastructure. Another point is there is a lot of data and control commands being exchanged in the system, and it is very important to have a secure system in place. And during this uh, webinar uh, series, we discuss some of the challenges and what we could do to overcome them. And today, we are also talking specifically on cybersecurity. Uh, next month, we're hosting a webinar on uh, reinforcement learning for charging control. Okay, without further ado, I'm excited to have Ahmad with us today to talk about uh, Internet of, of the IoT and everything, the security in a world out of control. Uh, Ahmad is a lecturer at the University of Southampton and his research uh, looks into platform integrity and confidentiality using trusted hardware. So without further ado, I'd like to give the presentation to Ahmed. Thank you, Miriam. Okay. Uh, thank you everyone for joining the, the webinar. Thank you, Miriam, for the introduction. Today I'm gonna talk about Internet of Things and uh, what are the challenges and why Internet of Things is an interesting topic for cybersecurity. When we're talking about Internet, Internet of Things, it can be really applied to many different places many different uh, segments and industries and the use cases are slightly different but the threat model is very different between those industries and how they use internet of things and we really got to a point where we have a lot of work being done on security in general and securing communication in the internet of things through using cryptography uh, adopting new technologies like uh, blockchain and mostly focusing on, on the network. What we fail to, to realize that Internet of Things devices are not the same as our desktops or laptops. And those differences make it much harder in designing them and designing security in them. In the webinar today, I will be mostly focusing on the system level and how to 
consider security and IoT devices and challenges when designing IoT devices. So the agenda for this talk, I will start by talking about IoT devices and context of security. Uh, we'll talk about attacks and threats, and then we'll talk about uh, security and privacy implications, what it means to, to the users, uh, challenges when designing IoT devices, gonna take a, a deep dive into how an IoT device look like, what assumption changes when we talk about IoT devices, and what do we need to do in order to make uh, IoT devices more resilient, available, and uh, more safe for us to use. So as I said, Internet of Things is quite uh, a large topic and there are really many, many systems that would apply for it. But where is it used? It's, it kind of dictates different type of attacks and different uh, threats that we need to, to, con to consider. For instance, if we're looking at a smart home where you have uh, your devices connecting to the network, the network becomes the most important thing for, and that you want to secure from an external intruder. The effect eventually can affect some, you know, the, the resident of the, ho the house, uh, a few individuals, it affects very specific things, but it doesn't have as much as larger, larger scale. Maybe that will change the future. The more we have smarter devices, if your fridge kind of get his own legs and his own arms and can attack a user, the story will, will change. But in a more realistic scenario, we're looking at industrial control systems. Once we take a look deeper into how these, um, the, the system, the IoT system are built, built for industrial control systems. The story is very different. For instance, if you look at uh, a water system where you have a sensor that constantly measures the temperature or the acidity of the water and something goes wrong with any of the sensors, this can, uh, can affect an entire city or an entire nation. In the automotive industry, everything is becoming uh, more becoming more spreaded in, in the car, more embedded devices to support more automation, uh, self-driving, and the result we have more compute, more sensors, more cameras. In one, ca in one, in one car, you might find about six or seven cameras, not eight. With self-driving cars, you will have much more of that. The brake system is controlled by a computer. The steering wheel will be controlled by a computer. And we need to make sure that all those work together and function well without any problem. Now, there's one point to be made about this here. We're not only talking about cybersecurity in this context, but cybersecurity would help in this context because we need to be ready to tackle any problem that comes, any signal integrity problem that arise in automotive. So what happened in case a device um, gets wrong measurements or wrong data from a specific sensor? Is it going to affect other devices in the system? Is there uh, a fallback device that's going to take over and try to, to uh, remediate the functionality and maintain the system up and running. How do we make sure that the, the system is resilient enough so we can really limit the amount of damage? This is the reality that we need to live with when we talk about things like a critical infrastructure, which very much is the internet of, of things. Now, moving a bit from automotive, we're going to a smart charging and that where you connect your, um, your car to, to charge and we try to maintain uh, and uh, design an infrastructure to fault all that. There's really also many elements in the chain. So even things like a cable, 
where you think, you know, it's acting, uh, it's a benign thing and there's nothing wrong with it. It also can completely change the way you interact with your car. It can be actually a means to go and attack your car. Smart grid is not, is not any better. You can take an entire country down. If you, if you do a device, uh, device attack on, on the network of a smart grid, you might put an entire city out, uh, out of electricity. And sometimes the damage takes, if, if the system is not designed well, it will take a long time to recover. It all depends on the scope of the attack. Uh, in the healthcare sector, everything is becoming more uh, devised as well, based on a small embedded uh, chips and compute, small computers. And this is also another, another uh, victor for attacks in order to perform cyber crime and uh, affect basically how IT devices working and make this uh, less secure. With having more embedded devices and, and more IoT system in everywhere, basically we are making things better, but at the same time, we are also increasing, you know, our, um, that tech surface where we can be vulnerable for, and there's a lot of things that can happen. Okay. And in order to realize what's going on in the IoT world, and how IT devices um, are designed, I'm, I'm gonna walk you a bit through how this whole thing looked like. So we start from somewhere cloud where everything needs to, to be stored and eventually to edge where someone needs to collect all this data, operate on it, a central point, and then to all the IT devices that are much uh, limited uh, and uh, if you have much larger amount of devices compared to uh, to the edge and uh, to the cloud. But we, what we really miss here, that in a cloud environment, when we talk about server, we talk about server that cost about 20,000 pounds, you know, probably the least for a good server and even more. You don't have the restriction of space. You don't have the restriction of power, you don't have many restrictions that you get with IoT. With Edge, it's kind of, you get the same thing. There is a different threat. It's not the data center. It's not really guarded, but it's still the same time. It has uh, more capabilities than IoT devices. The system are designed with larger chips, more power consumption, the, um, and thus basically can have more security aspect. But the reality of edge devices that they don't need to deal sometimes with the physical access of problem. While in IoT, the IoT case, we moved basically down from cloud to IoT and we have more restriction and these restriction make it very hard to go about designing security measures. Because the more we go down to IoT devices, we have less energy, but right. there's more, there, is, there are requirements on the power consumption for IoT devices. So in the automotive, there's even a standard for what is the level that you need to have anything above, you wouldn't be allowed in automotive. The compute is the same thing. We moved from uh, having, instead of having 64 cores in, in the cloud, you would have one core or two cores in some of the system. And with this reality, we just can't des design the same security measure that we have in place, but we're asked to basically design better security measure than we have in edge and cloud devices. So these things are contradicting and give it a hard time and challenging when designing security in IoT devices. So why is this important? If we are having IoT devices everywhere, then this is gonna affect basically every system that we have. And the first thing that we need to consider is things like natural disaster. If an earthquake happens, then what does it mean for a chemical factory or 
where there is more things in, in involved like a system that affect the entire city or entire nation like well, the water system. So we, we need to have basically measures in place to, to be able to detect those events. And I'll talk about that uh, a bit later and try to, to recover for, from this. Other than natural disaster, we have also the typical problem of hacking into devices. And there's a lot more focus on the network work and try to remotely connect and exploit software attacks um, compared to attack that happened like in the supply chain and attack that happened and, and on the hardware itself and exploiting hardware. In a matter of fact, there are many assumptions that have been broken in the last few years regarding uh, security. We always assumed that a remote attacker will be able to exploit software vulnerabilities, but we didn't think that a remote hacker will be able to exploit a hardware vulnerability if, if he has no software running on that device whatsoever. Uh, other things we need to recover from accidents, these things happen. And a matter of fact, even in, in any device, things like glitching or, uh, or, or some malfunction of device, you know, it happened one in, in a million times or 110 million, but there are really chances of things happen where when you're trying to read a specific bit in a chip would give you the, the, the wrong results. But again, one bit here and one change might end up have a fatal, a fatal implication on, on things like critical infrastructure. Tampering of devices, this is something that uh, more, that we have been seeing more and more, not only um, coming to the environment where the, where the device is, but also tampering at the level of the manufacturing or during the supply chain, trying to, to change how the, the BCP look like, the, the board design, or changing uh, uh, the manufacturing flow where basically you design specific chip and put it in silicon before it reaches to the user. This is actually thing that happened. So we need resiliency. We need the ability to re reduce the magnitude and the duration of disruptive events. For us to be able to do, to do that, we need hooks in place to anticipate and absorb, adapt, and recover. For the anticipation part, it's a, it's a quite a tough problem because what are the means in place to anticipate if there, there is an attack happen. So if we're looking at uh, the critical infrastructure in general, we can try to predict if there is some, a natural disaster is going to happen. But it's not always the case that I will be able to anticipate if there is an attack. I'm not gonna be able to anticipate if there is an accident or a glitch, but I do need to have things in, in place to protect me in the unlikely event something happened. And here where it leads me to the absorb part. I need to have hooks in place where if something goes wrong, for instance, I have a malfunction in a device, I will have redundancy. So basically the computing unit that is running the software will be running two software in parallel. And if, if one basically gets stuck or some glitch happen, then the other one will be basically able to absorb the impact and uh, detect it. For critical infrastructure, this matters a lot. And sometimes even these cases, I'm not gonna be able to absorb. And in the unlikely event something happened, I still need to adapt. That means what other things in place and what other hardware in place need to be installed in case something goes wrong and uh, the absorb measure uh, wasn't being able wasn't able to to uh, to remediate um, an attack or 
an accident or natural disaster. And the last part basically to, to be able to recover once uh, the system uh, when the system has has been tampered with, tacked, and to be able to do that as fast as possible. So you can see how these four elements varies between the environment that I talked about earlier. And I think like industrial control, this need to be very, very fast, need to be a lot of redundancy for the hardware and uh, the systems in place to think about every possible scenario and reduce the risk of something happening. While an IoT system like uh, smart homes, you can argue that you don't, ha you don't need that much of this redundancy. But today I will be mostly focusing on this type of attacks where things can be very intrusive. And um, if you have access to the device, you can do uh, uh, a lot and tamper to tamper with the system. Okay, so to, before I dive deep deeper into the semantics and the attacks and IoT devices, how they are designed, we need to talk about the enablers. How does IoT system look like? And what kind of element do you have in place in an IoT system? So this we have I have a paper when we started all this work in IoT security in 2013, and the basic blocks that you will find in most IoT devices is things like a sensor. A sensor could be in humidity, um, temperature, acidity, or any anything else. But you see this thing on the left side. I'm going to point to that. You see, this eventually sends a signal, right? It has some hardware logic in place where will basically measure something and eventually see there is a connection that is going to be feeding somewhere. So there are actually attacks where you can inject a signal here. You can intercept it or affect kind of signal that is being sent from the sensor itself to, um, to basically the processor that take this input and basically instruct the, the system to, to do something else and so on. And it's really not that hard. This kind of attack to inject, uh, to inject the signal between a sensor and the board and the, the chip, this is not much, uh, this much of not, not much expensive. You didn't need sophisticated logic like the one I'm gonna talk about later that cost 300,000 pounds and more to, to perform, perform an attack. But an industrial system, like consider a water system, one, inje one wrong injection, you could basically completely change the way the system behave and cause some fatal, fatal event. Uh, the sensor is to collect measurement and this is one place where you, um, attack can happen, but there are more things like an actuator where you can actually instruct the system to do something or move something. This is also again signal based. So even the, the bus connecting it, they are not high speed bus like the one you find on, on servers or in typical machines. Uh, RFID, these things, uh, they don't even operate sometimes on, on, on um, the only measured. So they, they operate by a specific uh, signal that uh, um, they, they receive and this is how it activate them. Uh, what else more? There are devices for, for stories, right, to store the, the software or to, to store specific parameters of the device. This is a common practice when you designed an, an IoT device. And here you have basically the, the board where, where you have you know, the, the chip that run your software and your firmware and your, that allow connection to all those uh, sensors and actuators to, to perform the function IoT devices. So we talked about the enablers. Now let's talk about what, what can go wrong and how can you attack the system. So physical attacks can be intrusive 
and non-intrusive in this front. And they can be expensive and they can be cheap. So things like we're seeing here on the left side, this is a common practice in designing um, IoT devices and system in general. These are storage devices. Those storage devices are the place basically where you store things like keys, cryptographic keys when you want to boot your system. So they participate in the authentication process when you want to load your own software. They also can we also give you the configurations of um, the platform itself. That means uh, at what speed you should work, um, at what um, at what frequency, and some vo voltage uh, configuration, and so on. Removing removing things like the storage device, this is an E-square PROM, doesn't really cost much. You, you can take any board and you can replace the E-square PROM quite easily. Matter of fact, if, if you guys are familiar with how UEFI works, this is a quite common practice for um, UEFI firmware, which is used in IoT devices, and where it's stored basically the key that would say, okay, yeah, you can authenticate the rest of the software that I have in the system before loading. So imagine if someone can install in different software then have complete control on what he can do. So we, wa we want to prevent that. But removing this device and just even putting something that is empty or something that's returning an error can basically result in loading any software that you want on the chip that would run the software. So any security measure in place would be useless. Now, the, the problem here that I'm gonna talk about later is why, why are we coming to, to, to this? Why, why is this happening? Why don't we store this um, on the chip? And I will talk about this later. Things like um, storage devices also store not only the, the keys and some configuration of the device, but they also store the code. So there's an important value having um, a code that is locked, that some, if someone has physical access to it or hack the software during runtime, cannot come and change it and later on and to, to, to load the different uh, software. Matter of fact, many of these storage devices, if you, if you know how to uh, hook your, your signals and connection to it, you can connect from the side and you can program them. They come with the programmability aspects from a sideband interface. What I'm trying to show you in this picture, this is actually from the, the Xbox. And uh, with the Xbox case, without talking much on it, normally the code when it resides in a flash device, it's locked. That means if you connect to it, you cannot change it. In order to do this locking mechanism, you just have to have the right technology in place where you have a persistent storage and writing to this persistent storage can basically prevent someone changing some, some, um, some areas in the storage device. This will allow, allow that any code is locked and cannot change. That means you can't change the firmware, you cannot load an operating system. That means you can't run your own code in there. You can't hack my device. But people will go to great, you know, limits and break things in order to, to hack into devices. And what basically found out in, in this picture, if, you're, if you know exactly the right place to dig into, you can basically disable this locking mechanism and basically put um, a new software of your own. Now, imagine this happens actually during a supply chain where someone connect to a device that's supposed to have a specific code unlocked and you know it changed the firmware in there. That basically what thought is be is good and is going to you know do that specific function end up uh, more of a rootkit that injected and loading a user system. This attack also not that expensive actually. Well, you only need the access to the platform and you need that specific screw to dig into the right place. There are a lot of videos online actually you can find about this. 
Um, the third attack, you know, we know that we, knew, we need network security. These devices talk to each other and we need to secure the communication. And we assume that if we have the right cryptography in place, that means everything you know, will behave correctly. And if you have a, an attacker that is basically listening on the network and capturing uh, the packets sent between devices, he won't be able to, to understand a thing. But this is not really the reality when you have a physical access to the device. And I don't mean by physical access, you need to actually interact with the device itself. So this has actually been done on a, on a mobile phone. So there was one application that basically running OpenSSL to start a secure communication. And during that process where the encrypt and decrypt happening and sending a traffic, basically you have someone with an antenna, it's about five meters away. And he was basically measuring it and trying to tune his device to get what is the frequency of uh, the crypto algorithm that is running. So there are actually, there are devices that are a bit more expensive, but if you are able to write, uh, to, to find the right frequency, not the frequency of, uh, that the device operates in, but the frequency of um, uh, that you capture uh, the, the cryptographic uh, operation, then basically you'll be able to collect enough measurement and um, be able to crack the key that is used for, for the encryption. And okay, yeah, this is a very specific and uh, hard to acquire knowledge. I agree with that. It, it is very specific knowledge, but it is, it is possible to do. We have, there are a lot of paper actually about, this is called uh, uh, SPA and DPA. This is in this case, it's electromagnetic measurement and stand for uh, simple power analysis and uh, differential power analysis. And there are actually, even when there are protection measures, we're still limited. So when we talk about cryptography, we'll dig into that a bit, a bit more later on, there's what we call the security level. But in this case, we don't need to kind of do brute force on 128-bit keys or 256-bit eight keys. It's enough to have one million measurement, depends on actually the level of the implementation of the protocol itself, or even 1,000 measurement in order to be able to crack that key. So even if things are encrypted, this might not help me in case I actually have within close proximity from the device. Uh, these are normally how things look like for devices that um, can uh, look at the frequency and tune it and uh, show you the analog signal of it to, to analyze it. And there are devices, they're quite expensive, around $100,000, dollars but they're they are available. Um, moving to the right side, this is the normal case of a remote attacker. If you have access to the network, um, there are a lot of software vulnerability, and this is a classic uh, situation. So this is what he's been talking about, mostly in the context of security of IoT. On the left side, this is my favorite. So think, think about a device where you had put all your security measure in place, where you have the right cryptography, you, ha you have some hardware measure to, to in place to, to authenticate and make sure that you're loading your right software and firmware. In order to enable the security, normally there are things that are, reside on chip itself. They have to be persistent. We're saying, okay, from this moment on, I'm secure. That means anything I load, it has to be either signed, I will authenticate it, I'll be good. The assumption that anything that is coming from outside a boundary will be basically untrusted. And thus I need to make sure that it's good. But even these measures can be disabled. So with this, actually this is a laser injection. It actually, this one has in particular three heads, it's pretty advanced. This is something that costs about $400,000. Uh, $400, 
And with, um, with the laser injection, basically you can affect the specific registers. You can affect the specific storage area within the chip where we store the code and where we store the, um, where we store basically the data and that is used by the software that we're operating on. It's quite expensive, but if you want to hack into device and disable specific security function, you would be able to do, to do that. Okay. Now let's get into the attacks a bit. This is not all, um, this is not all theory and just picture sharing things. There actually been attacks that have been happening in, in the last years. And things that actually are really hard to recover from, taking me back to, to the point of what do we really have in place when we find an attack or find a vulnerability and we recover from. So the, in the right side, things like the hard bleed, it's a vulnerability that existed for really many years more than 10 years, but even after we found the vulnerability, five years later, we still have many unpatched servers. We still had hard time in basically moving away from that specific vulnerable version. So many of the systems, and this is a system problem. If you design your system where you can't basically recover and remediate the, um, the attack, then you have a problem. But this is a realistic scenario. You, you already have some system in place. Some systems have hundreds of servers. And moving them can cost a lot of money to, 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 the, to the infrastructure provider. This is an example of security that weren't applied in mind in this whole framework of applying cybersecurity that I will be talking about a bit later. Uh, more things about trusted execution environments where I spent most of my research doing in, in a cloud environment. So things like trusted execution environment and IoT devices, and in this case, actually, this attack was on a mobile device. We don't have the right hardware measures. It require more, um, it requires more hardware capability to support things like trusted execution environment where we can isolate code. So we go from hardware solution to software solution because we can't, we can't have the support of those security measures when designing IoT devices. Uh, more things on the software side that can affect things at scale. So if you have the same vulnerability, multiple devices, it can affect uh, millions. So how do we also re recover from that? And it's quite tough. Things that have been assumed to, to be right uh, and to be correct when this, doing this uh, threat modeling and completely different um, than reality, this is what has been found out in the last few years, are things related to, to the hardware and the exploit of the hardware. So we assume that if there's a bug in the software, then a remote attacker basically that have specific access to, to that service might be able to exploit it. But in this case, the attack happened from, from, from a remote attacker that was able to do to exploit some bug in the hardware in order to affect the data in memory. So IoT devices and desktop servers, they need to store the data and the code during runtime. We don't operate out of storage devices. This is for speed. We can't basically every time we need to access the device just go to, um, to slow storage device. So the design of a computer system assume that there will be a DRAM, or this is the memory equivalent to what many people call RAM in the system memory, called to DDR. A bug in the DDR in the memory controller would allow you basically to start flipping, flipping some of the bit in the memory. So if you were able to access um, a specific region of memory, about 10,000 10, 10, times, 100,000 times, 
there is a limitation in how the, how the DDR uh, memory controller is implemented that eventually will affect basically the data that reside adjacent to that specific uh, row that is trying to access. This is where the row came from and the hammer basically because you're really hammering that specific row. So imagine you have a cup full of water and you just banging next to it. And this is what will happen basically, the water will be spilled outside. And this is actually what happened in, in the DRAM when you do a hammering effect. You will start randomly a changing uh, a few number of bits. So with the, with the raw hammer, things are not really that random though, because we've seen attacks that were able to completely change some bits in the memory relating to the access and eventually the attacks were devised enough that allowed some software or so, some remote attacker to access specific bits and specific aspects that he wanted in, in the system. Some areas in the memory Otherwise, you wouldn't be having access to if it wasn't for for Roham. Things like uh, the Linux kernel, where we we have some code that hasn't changed in really, really many years, also been exploited, in, in order to to be able to sniff uh, SSH uh, password and so on. So knowing that sometimes even in open source that I know what is the pattern on the software and how the software works, I can basically go and devise my, my attack to kind of cause a trigger that would affect the hardware that will eventually cause um, an exploit. Okay. More, more on that, supply chain. This is something that's been published in 2019 and a few months later actually was demonstrated by, by hacker how easy to do. Normally in a computer system, you, you would have the CPU where it's mainly running the software. And basically that CPU can't really store the code, can't really store the code and data. And thus it have to pull things from outside. Things like uh, trusted platform models or uh, SPI devices, this is a typical case where you can install uh, a malicious device in between those components in order to affect the way they work with each other. We assumed that if, if a board you know, is already manufactured, it has the component com connected to each other through the board, then we can't really hack uh, what in between devices. But other than the story that was published by Bloomberg, there's actually some attacker demonstrated this and it didn't cost them more than $200 to change the PCP and put this malicious um, hardware on the device. Um, <clears throat> more on the medical side, we have um, pacemakers and those pacemakers as well, we, connect, we can connect to, to them through, um, where, through wireless. We have also insulin pumps and also those have some their own compute. And they have seen attackers where also we're able to inject the 50, 50 injection in one minute. This will end up killing anyone basically that would receive this amount. So all these devices kind of play an important factor in our daily life. They, they pretty much integrated in every aspect. And we do need to have some security measure in place to, to guarantee that these things can't be done easily. Even if someone's trying to, to attack those devices, we would have things, uh, another measures in place to prevent or detect and try to minimize the time of, um, of attack. But what we really get, um, very much a lot of outdated documents about data protection. Uh, this is one example uh, from a very lengthy document and about data protection act. 
that an appropriate technical and organizational measure should be taken against unauthorized or unlawful processing of personal data and against accidental loss or destruction of or damage to personal data. It doesn't say anything about uh, hardware devices. It doesn't talk about how to, what measure is in place. It only causes more, more confusion. What we want to remember, we still have things in place that do help us design the system. We, we have sources of threats and we need to tackle the confidentiality, the CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and to put these, to design the system, uh, considering the risk to, and how much the risk high according to each, each one of them. There is more that, uh, described about uh, the threat-based um, attacks and how things can go wrong and the requirement is my papers with Professor Andrew Martin on threat-based security analysis for the Internet of Things where I go and uh, describe more the security and privacy of the one. But you, basically what it really boils to, so things like integrity of most important, people like to go and just tamper with how devices work. This is something that uh, we've seen most attacks coming from in the last uh, few years. And um, the more research, the more research we do, we are actually finding out that tampering is not as hard as we thought it is. So it's not an attack that we need to spend hundreds and millions of dollars to to perform a successful attack. And knowledge is spread very fast. So things that are mostly relevant for IoT devices would be things like device tampering and its execution and side channels attacks, as I said, um, you know, like um, SPA and DPA measurement, uh, signal injection, and someone who's trying basically to take control of the device and have elevation of the probability. In some cases, like the critical infrastructure, denial of service for availability is an extra important. And there are still research to be done to figure out what really other aspects of availability. In my paper with Professor Andrew Martin, we touched the surface of things, but there are really more research that needs to be done in this area to, to figure out what's really the requirement and, and what are the risk involved and where do we need to invest more uh, on the security front to make those device, the IoT devices more secure. Traditional security measure that we have in place today, uh, things like a trusted platform model. This is where um, it's another chip basically that resides on the platform where I'm, I'm storing uh, the keys and I'm storing uh, uh, my asset, the important asset. Sometimes you won't uh, find trusted platform model on devices because they're very expensive. So you would have embed embedded secure storage within uh, the chip itself that is designed for the IoT device. And sometimes you won't find any of them because designing those is, is require some changes in the hardware that would make them would make them a bit bigger and not suitable for, for the environment where they're supposed to operate. If you have limitation on the size of that specific chip, then you can't have embedded as much strong embedded secure storage. Things for ramp uh, tamper resistant, we need more redundant signals because if, if someone tampering with the signal like a laser injection, then I don't need to be moving right away from secure to non-secure, it's not binary. So I need to have a measure in place where, okay, even if you affected this, I'm still detecting that there is an error and I'm not gonna operate. Error detection and correction to, to some degree, this is quite hard to do anything more than uh, two, two or three bits. Uh, resiliency, we want to guarantee that whatever firmware uh, and software is loaded is, is good. So, Things like a secure boot in place is quite common practice to achieve resiliency and remote attestation in order to report on the software and firmware that is running on the system. Policy, more things like physical boundaries, 
where I have uh, locked uh, locations as well, having locks around some uh, uh, some boxes or the device, the packaging itself need to be more secure, not to allow someone to easily access the internal of it and evict it. The privacy consideration also we have problem. We don't need to store uh, personal identifiable information. Uh, transparency of the data that is being collected. This is not something that uh, available much today. There's uh, many, many documents that is given and uh, you know where you put agree to this or agree to that. We don't know how the storage devices and IoT devices implement secure ratios in order to guarantee that data is not present anymore once uh, uh, my request or what is once it's being it's being done and doesn't have to operate more on my data. Okay. So this is how mostly look like. Normally you would have a chip and you would have, this is a core where you would run your software and uh, firmware. In order to do that, most IoT devices are, today you can find the MIPS or ARM-based. If it's ARM-based, for instance, come with an SRAM. Most devices come with an SRAM within the chip where you store some of the code and data. So things that are slightly different from PC devices and servers, where you have sensor, actuator, and cameras, this is very much direct toward that. We don't have SATA drives. This is, will make it a lot bigger and more expensive. We don't have DDR memory in, in place. So we can't really operate as fast and read things from memory as fast. What we do have, most of the time, we have a USB or a UR. This would allow you to go and connect to the device to, let's say, program a new firmware and software. These interfaces are a lot exploited in order to try to extract firmware and software outside the device and try to reverse engineering, understanding how, how uh, the boot flow works and then try to inject uh, your own code, uh, your code in. Uh, PCI devices, those are really high uh, cost uh, interconnect, uh, depends really on, on the platform, but those also haven't been designed with security um, in mind. The protocol itself doesn't really support security and aspects of cryptography. This is something that uh, the community has been working on recently and there's now more change in the standard to support uh, um, confidentiality and, and integrity. So these are power constraint devices. Um, I can't really do the same thing and um, they can't have the same security measure in the chip as um, a desktop or a server. So the, the trust boundary, the assumption in IoT devices because of the physical presence is anything that is coming from outside the chip is untrusted, right? So if I'm, if I'm loading my data from a storage device here, where I'm loading my firmware or my software, I need to make sure that it's operate. So things like secure boot will guarantee that I'm loading a good firmware. But the problem with secure boot that it requires some changes within the chip and sometimes the chip basically cannot, uh, cannot support it. The interfaces, all those interfaces are quite easy to, to inject. If you have a physical access, you will be able to change that signal that is coming from your sensor or from actuator. The frequency actually of pulling the, of pulling the measurements is not, is not that fast. Cameras, also the same thing. Depends if it has embedded, um, embedded security in it, but then eventually most cameras will connect either through the PCI bus or some other measure, but all these devices, all these interfaces can, can be tampered with. So I need to accommodate to anything that is coming from outside my physical boundary. Okay, so on the cryptography front, if we're going back to this image, these devices are um, small. So when you design um, chips for automotive, there are specific standards that you need regarding safety and regarding power consumption and 
sometimes actually you will see some industries that would uh, request what is the size of the chip basically that connect to the sensors and where you can run your firmware software. Having this in mind, if things like storing keys using a trusted platform model is not an option because it will require basically uh, more interfaces, it will require more power, it will also make the device more expensive, larger. So many of these IoT devices unlikely will have a trusted platform model in place for storing keys. Now, storing keys on chip is quite also um, a challenging because any technology to uh, any technology to allow persistent storage within uh, within a chip, it basically make it a lot bigger. These have uh, these technologies that allow persistent storage are expensive or even limited in the number of read and write or uh, the security function of it, like you have redundant bit or if if uh, um, if it malfunctions so as a result it takes a lot of place on the chip and as a result it can't really make it into into a chip it's not it's not an option so in the server side and on the edge and on the desktop side we don't have that limitation so you would see things like Intel boot guard or uh, ARM trust zone where there are technologies in place that would allow that. This would prevent us from implementing things like large keys, like RSA 4K, many times wouldn't be an option on, on some IoT devices. Randomness is another issue because this is another specific hardware. Randomness is really uh, an issue compared to desktop devices because with randomness, this is how you want to generate keys if you want to push a key for a communication protocol and so on and without randomness you you can't really do all your cryptographic um, protocol but we can't really rely on software unlike server because the sources of entropy in iot devices the result that was also another uh, research that has been done in this area and it doesn't have that much entropy because the entropy from server is mostly acquired from IO devices and that generate a lot of randomness. So with, with IoT devices, the research showed that you can't gather as much entropy because you don't have as many IO devices. So that will opt for a hardware solution, which makes the chip um, a bit larger. It requires more voltage and uh, more hardware in place. <clears throat> and the last point about side channeling in that uh, side channel most uh, symmetric uh, most uh, cryptographic uh, software libraries and and even the hardware part are not really designed with um, side channels mitigation in place because if you want to design any cryptographic uh, primitives with side channels attacks uh, in, in mind that will basically increase the size of your of your hardware by two four times depends on your implementation and depends on what kind of protection you you want to get so this is another challenge that we have when designing iot devices on the resiliency side this is all need to to work together so sometimes you won't be able to get uh, everything in place, but we need to figure out what uh, what are the absolutely necessary hardware primitives in place to allow us. And this is where things are a bit lacking behind. So the general framework and in, in place by by uh, by Nest for um, improving critical infrastructure, um, basically mandate having you know things these three basically steps. We have the post-disaster, where we have a rehabilitation phase, we have a recovery, we have a response, we have, um, sorry, pre-disaster, we have prevention, mitigation, readiness. When the disaster occurs, we're basically that where it has the impact, and then we have a rehabilitation strategy, recovery, and uh, response. But these things haven't been as much looking on the hardware side to 
basically give some triggers to provide to provide uh, resiliency. This is more a framework that kind of look at the entire critical infrastructure. So there is more work that need uh, to be done on on this front. There are things in place uh, like um, like certification by NIST and PIPs, like cryptographic models that is try to tackle the requirement of uh, how the cryptography is implemented because changes and how um, an AES or an RSA algorithm is implemented really matter or the, or the randomness of it can be completely useless if it doesn't really have uh, the right uh, implementation. So these standards help us basically get some of these things right and to design secure, uh, secure systems. Now, in order to, to get to a better place with IoT devices, we need to have security by design approach. We need to, to move more a bit closer to the implementation of the devices and not only just focus on the overall interaction between the devices. We need to look into more into hardware triggers where can be cost effective, are realistic to um, implement today, despite all the restriction of uh, power, size, and so on. And we need those to help us basically detect the attacks and um, allow the system to uh, remediate and recover basically before the attacks happen. And there's a lot of research that is being done, but there's more work that we need to do. Uh, we need to be able to recover of uh, firmware and software in case an attack happens and uh, something go wrong with a specific system. So we need more redundancy as well. We need to have some measures to, to be able to stop an attack when it happens. Kill switch might be an option, but in many systems it's very hard to implement something like a kill switch where, where you just basically press one button and um, stop, uh, take an action to basically stop an attack. <clears throat> More on that as well, we talked about if I go back to this slide, we talk about how a system design. This is more of a sample architecture and system, a high level system view of how things look like. But in reality, you have more components in place where they actually run their own uh, code. So is there a microcontroller or another chip basically within that specific chip? So we need to have also privilege, privilege separation between these entities in case something get compromised you won't have the whole system compromised uh, with it that means one entity can't really affect all the entities in the system so privilege separation normally is a good approach to to go and um, and basically separate between and limit the attack from from happening but we we'll need more work in this done when designing uh, 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 chip devices for chip, chip hardware for IoT devices. So if I summarize the main point from, from my talk today, it's really challenging to embed hardware security measures in IoT devices. We have the constraint of the size, uh, the power to, um, to be used, and the results very hard to make uh, many of the security measures in place. It's very hard to support prevention measure against physical attacks as well, because many of those uh, measures will end up um, causing the chip much larger space and won't make it to a realistic implementation of a, a chip that would meet the, the requirement of voltage. The security and privacy implication, implication can be critical, especially in a critical infrastructure where um, you know, wrong, uh, sig um, wrong signal can, can uh, cause a fatal effect and cause a total shutdown of the system. 
PCs integrity measures are not as suitable for IoT devices because we designed all those uh, security measures to without the limitation of uh, power, compute, and uh, size of the chip. And we need to have more resiliency aspect because sometimes we can't trust the software because of physical attacks. We can glitch, we can do all sorts of things to, to the software. So we need more hardware triggers in places to help us do um, design resilient platform and resilient um, infrastructure as a, as an all. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, if our participants have questions, do please leave them in the chat box. Meanwhile, are you able to share with us uh, what are you working on in NVIDIA, which is not confidential? Um, just a second. Yeah. Yeah. So many of the problems that um, I talked about today are are things that we we look at uh, carefully. So things like uh, physical access to chips. So my my background is a lot in the designing uh, chips and system on chips. Where I spent about ten years designing a secure system and. Uh, through the years, I a lot focused on trusted execution environment. But in the context of IoT, I have seen more requirement regarding the physical access. There's more, um, there has been more attacks on, on, on chips and trying to tamper with devices to kind of like load malicious firmware or software. And uh, physical attacks are really getting e not getting easier, but cyber criminals are getting more more familiar with physical attack. They're not as hard. So we we'll try to look into how to design more security and measures in place to protect against attacks like uh, the sort of I described in this talk. Do you have a blog where you share some of the things you can share about the latest advancements in, in, on these areas? Um, yeah, I can share. I can share that with you if you, if you want. Uh, I can send that. What a blog, you mean? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between trusted platform modules and hardware security modules? Oh, okay. Per good question. Okay. So trusted platform models are kind of in small chips. They are not designed for scalability. So you would see actually in most uh, server or desktop, you would have a TPM, trusted platform model. They store, store your keys, uh, but it's very small in size, let's put it this way. It's a very small chip. Uh, the interface to it also is not really uh, that fast. It's a cost exactly two, two three dollars. It wasn't designed to, uh, to, to be scalable. While HSM on the other hand, they are quite common. You find them a lot in, in cloud environments on, on people who need to deal with a lot of uh, cryptographic keys. And um, with HSM, basically, you can support a lot of users uh, at the same time compared to TPM. So things like HSM, you, you would uh, find the entire box rather than a chip that costs $3. Some HSMs would cost uh, $20,000 even. They are designed to be more scalable. They also have more measures in place. So a lot of the TPM that you would find in, uh, in, in, um, in desktops and servers, they wouldn't have some protection measure like what I've mentioned, like differential power analysis or electromagnetic measurements. But with HSM, they have to support um, some certification with high level. So the certification of FIPS 140-2, this is quite uh, common and accepted the certification in the industry. If you care about, most companies actually would require a FIPS certification if they are dealing. So TPM 
have a certification of one FIPS 140, you would find level one, level two. With HSM, you would have level three, which basically someone can't really tamper, tamper detection and tamper resiliency. Uh, in the context of electric vehicle charging, uh, a manufacturer that's starting now, should they uh, make sure they include a, a, a TPM or an HSM in their hardware? Uh, well, we're talking about cables or then which system? So that would be a more of a system system question, right? Even in cables, so in data so centers- So not the cable, some, the actual charger, where let's say this is a smart charger, so, that, so it will receive commands and accordingly uh, do something. So there is a bit of intelligence in the hardware. So yeah, most likely TPM, they wouldn't need any system. But why? Because this would, wouldn't require the same scale. HSM would more require would be more required in a cloud context. Okay, and are there a lot of manufacturers or of TPMs and hard and HSMs? Yes, there there is quite a lot. And things these are... uh, TPM like Infineon, you can find they can find very a lot of TPM defined designed by Infineon. Okay, and what about the hardware security modules? Yep, the same. You have um, some in the US, some here in Europe, things like a um, company like Thales, the design that you send. Yeah. And are those uh, certified? Yeah, they come with their own uh, certification. It's own very certification. Specific certification. So I, we can just start a company and develop uh, HSMs and sell them and say we, we have developed our own certification? Oh, no, no, no. You have to go through a tedious certification process. So with the certification process, it takes about a year to certify a specific product, sometimes even more. Yeah. Depends, on, uh, depends on the model itself and the device. But certification is a very tedious process. Okay, which is good to hear, obviously. Uh, yeah. Like there's so much happening, so much, um, uh, let's say a, a, a manufacturer of a new product that needs to take care or, or know about where do people where should they start to know about all these things if they are, cannot afford the security consultant or if they cannot have their own security teams in place there there is a lot of papers um, out there actually a research paper on this type of physical attacks so people should be uh, should be should be looking for for the research paper and what researchers are doing on the physical attacks and um, the thing that I mentioned in my talk. Yeah, but also we're moving towards a future where if a company is not able to meet the basic security requirements with a, with a device that is connected to our critical infrastructure, then they shouldn't bother. They need to ensure that they are abiding by the security measures. Yeah, and there are a lot of uh, certification in place uh, coming for that, right? So things like uh, uh, things like uh, FIPS 143, which is also a specification written by NEST regarding cryptographic models. So I'm citing, I cited in my uh, talk SP 800-175P, which is um, the specification for cryptographic models. There are things related also to booting the software and making sure the right measure for recovery and for resiliency in place. So these are all important to, to, to look at when designing um, you know, a specific system, IoT system. Yeah, okay. Um, how much memory can a, a trusted platform module protect? Can someone store a fairly large number of strong cryptographic certificates on it? N no, not within, not within. So this is the difference between TPM and HSM. So TPM are not meant to scale. So you wouldn't have um, large, uh, storage area within a TPM. You, you would be lucky if you have more than 500 kilobyte or, or one megabyte, unlikely. So, but the way it handles it, and this is more of a system problem rather than security problem. It says basically, if you want to use a specific key, you basically load it inside the TPM. So software would load it. And basically when it wants to use a different key, it would load it out and then load another key. While with HSM, you can have as many key loaded um, into it. 
So the next time you want to use the TP, the HSM for, for let's say encrypting, then you wouldn't need to load it first and then basically ask it to encrypt. So that basically make it much scalable, faster to, to do. Well, with TPM, because of this limitation, um, there it's much slower. But some systems doesn't require that uh, that speed. Thank you. Can you give examples where we need to actually store a large number of strong cryptographic certificates? Yeah, you can you can think about um, you can think about the cloud environment, right? Where you give where you give a service of uh, of in, of storing encrypted data, right? Like you like your Dropbox or your Google Drive or something else. You want your data to be encrypted when it's uh, present there. So you can basically use that key, use that HSM to store, you know, multiple keys of different uh, users. So all of them wouldn't really feel that, um, wouldn't feel that basically there is another user using it. If you were to, let's say, use a TPM, you would basically, let's say, take you hours on top of hours to store, you know, um, few few hundred megabytes. While with HSM, they are designed to basically be high performance. That means they have much more power. So you you can basically support, you know, up to loading. I'm giving you a number from my head now, something like a uh, one hundred thousand keys, and you could have, you know, in encryption of about you know 200 kilo uh, operation per second for for sign this kind of the the number thank you uh, you made the point about being close to a device uh, makes it possible to break in its encryption uh, can you say a little bit more about that yeah so the idea is to measure the the power or the electromagnetic uh, emission that is coming out of it and basically if you hook and find the right frequency you would be able with enough measurements there are algorithms in place to to crack that key so you need to be basically close with an antenna and that basically it's connected to another basically device where it stores those measurements and every time you know you do encrypt and decrypt operate, and you will capture different measurements. If you collect, let's say, ten thousand measurement, twenty thousand measurement, one million measurement, you will be able to detect that key, depend on the algorithm um, and how it's tuned to break that key. Thank you. We got a question. Uh, what is the best alternative to IoT available at present? I'm assuming they mean that. Uh, IoT at present is not as secure as it should be. So how do we move to what we have now to something more secure? Uh, that's a quite a tough question. I'm not sure how to answer it actually. <laughs> um, I think that we are getting there and getting uh, more uh, more security in IoT devices, but there there's still more work to to be done. Like if we move to billions of connected devices in five years, surely we need to take into account security. I agree. I so agree. how far are we from being on the right track to, to make sure our billions of connected devices are secure? Um, we're not that much far off. I think there's a lot of initiatives that is being done on the industry to uh, to request uh, and to mandate that uh, manufacturer, chip manufacturer have more security in place. So if you see the work that is being done by the open computing group on security, they're now coming up with a specification in place to, um, uh, to kind of, specification in place to kind of give to uh, the chip manufacturers and a standard that is beyond NEST that would mandate how would you go about designing security um, and chips and uh, that will make it into IoT devices. There is also some work that's going on on the on some um, groups like the PCIe where they're looking also into security 
the same thing go into some management group. There are several groups now that uh, define standards that uh, are looking into this seriously. So I think we are on the right track there. Okay. Um, th there was a follow-up question on your la on the um, if you can look at the chat box. Uh, yeah. What the RFID devices, and then after that, like, do you have any views uh, or do you want to say anything about the Chinese chip manufacturers? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, RFI, RFID devices are uh, are tough because with RFID devices, it really depends what kind of technology you get in place and how sophisticated it is. But it's really the typical problem because you could have passive and active. And with the passive, you just receive a signal. So there is also the limitation of how much you can load an RFID with and how much it, um, it can handle. So RFID by itself alone, there are security measures. They tend to be more, more expensive, but really depends where are they used and uh, what are the, the threat they're trying to protect against. Normally RFID will have to connect to other systems. So most likely when you design uh, security in RFID, then you would try to kind of minimize the amount of functionality you will have in RFID. But you do, we do have today things like uh, secure chips where you find in, in SIM cards and, um, and so on. Uh, regarding the Chinese chip manufacturer, it's nobody, nobody really know what's going on there. I, I honestly, you know, can't, uh, can't compare and tell what, what's going on with that uh, Chinese chip manufacturer. We have time for three more questions. Sure. So how much in percentage terms would it cost a manufacturer to make sure their device is secure? How, say that again, how much in percentage? So how much, let's say a device is costing uh, X, like what is, how much more it's going to cost them if they take into account security by design? Uh, actually quite a lot, really a lot. a lot. Did you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is really, this is really disruptive. So if it's uh, quite a lot without regulation, why would the manufacturer want to, uh, produce something that's going to cost them a lot more if they're not obliged to do so. That's why we need standards in place. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um, have you come across any issues with the usage of public key infrastructure? In what context? Well, like we're talking about it right now in electric vehicles, uh, like for like as a, as a good option for trust in the system. Um, I want to know if there are disadvantages, if there has been some issues from other, I mean, from other sectors. I mean, public key infrastructure is, is quite large, depends if it built on using just uh, certificates, like how the internet works, then yeah, there are probably more, more, uh, <clears throat> more concerned there and we probably need to look further into how to, to enhance it because you know, many people believe that the whole concepts and how the internet operate based on certificate is broken because you need to trust entire chain of certificates and you don't know who signed what and you can't know if you can trust everyone in the chain. But in the context of uh, hardware security and what I talked about here, uh, public key um, cryptography is quite good. This is what would allow you to keep your private key safe somewhere and your public key on the platform for authentication, which is unlike the symmetric cryptography, for instance, where if someone has access to your device, now he has access to the key that you're used for, you know, encrypting your firmware and thus you won't be protected anymore. So I would say that for integrity, I would more promote uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography rather than symmetric cryptography. Yeah. 
And last question, uh, are you keeping up with the work on privacy preserving machine learning? No, not at the moment. Okay. Okay, that's it. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, anything you'd like to add before we finish? Uh, no, thank you. I hope you enjoyed uh, this talk. Definitely. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.